Let's bring in the vice chair of BlackRock, Philip Hildebrand, who joins us for an exclusive conversation. Also, who knows the SNB and actually the Swiss complex intimately. So, Philip, what a, what a treat, what a day to have you on. As, I mean, it feels like momentous because it's the first major central bank to cut rates. Yeah, the, we've been waiting for this for a long time. The market has been pricing it and had to come off. And now, basically, you know, the first one is out of the gates. Not surprisingly that it's the SNB in the sense that uh, Switzerland had by far the best inflation record uh, through this difficult period of the pandemic. Uh, so it's, it's a courageous step, but perfectly justifiable when you look at the inflation forecast and the inflation data uh, these last couple of years. So what does a policy mistake look like, not from s and but, but also for others? Is there a danger that actually if you cut too quickly, then inflation actually is rampant under control, and so it makes your job double harder to, to get on top of that? I think the main challenge they face, all the central banks effectively, and certainly the Fed, is that goods inflation continues to come down. That's the post-pandemic adjustment. That will settle at roughly zero, which is where typically historically goods inflation is. What is not going to happen, in my view, is service inflation is not going to come down. Uh, we have very strong uh, labor markets. Wages are strong. And so my guess is service inflation is going to turn out to be sticky when it settles. And in combination between goods at zero and service inflation somewhere around 3 percent, let's say, that suggests to me that what we're going to end up with a kind of a rate that is going to be higher. And so I think what you're going to see is a higher for longer story that will ultimately kind of feed through the, um, you know, the short term adjustment of, of rates now beginning to ease, policy rates beginning to ease. Um, Philip, for many years you were, of course, in charge of the SNB. We're now looking at live pictures of Thomas Jordan uh, speaking to, to report. I know that room very well, gathered there to try and understand the path forward. He's also said he will step down. What's the intricacies on, on I guess, the complexities of, of just managing the Swiss economy right now? Well, I think that, you know, just keeping, keeping the track record of the SNB, having, I mean, the, the legacy of Thomas, of course, is that he has the best inflation track record of any central bank. Uh, and so I think that's the principal uh, challenge going forward to make, to make sure that there's no question that that credibility on inflation will be maintained. And then in the longer term, the question will be, and that's partly an SMB question, but more a regulatory question, how do you deal with a bank that is going to be very, very large compared to GDP? Uh, and that's, of course, the, the legacy in a sense of the failure of Credit Suisse. So uh, that, those will be the main challenges uh, going forward, I'd say, for his successor. But would he be worried about market reaction right now? So no, I don't think so. I think he's, you know, they, I mean, they've known how the, the markets will they, react they know it. how to surprise markets. They've done that before. As I said, I think he could certainly perfectly justify the decision today. He could have also waited. But in a sense, when you look at the inflation data, the inflation forecast, there is not much point in, in waiting here. So why not go ahead? So I don't anticipate any problems. And if he, if he gets a little bit of uh, currency weakness out of this, uh, then I think you know, that's perfectly fine. So, so this uh, will not create any major kind of market reactions. But it does signal to the world that we have kind of turned the corner, that uh, central banks are easing. And then the question will be, where does all this settle in the long term? Yeah, but, but then if you look <clears> at actually what we heard from Jay Powell, I mean, he was quite tentative. Right. And, and again, it, see, he, he's a lot less hawkish. And even the dot plot gave us a, a lot less hawkishness that we could have seen. Well, I think they've succeeded very well. Remember, when we last spoke in Davos, <clears throat> we had pricing in the market that was just not realistic. So the Fed has succeeded in squeezing that out. We're now looking at three cuts going forward. It seems pretty clear to me uh, that the Fed is intent on cutting rates, so on following uh, Thomas Jordan. Um, and, and that will happen um, unless something terrible happens. What's also clear, though, when I look at the details of the, the charts, the, the dots going forward, that you know, there is an implicit recognition that longer term, the inflation path and the interest rate path is going to be sticky. There's kind of an implicit recognition that we are likely going to see a higher neutral rate level. He didn't explicitly say that, but if you look at the, the, the dots, it's there. The inflation numbers were actually slightly adjusted upwards for the, the, the next two years to come.
And I think that's going to be the real story here. We are going to touch 2%. Uh, inflation is coming down quickly, but it's mostly a goods inflation story. The real question will be where does service inflation settle going forward? Yeah, and actually, this is, uh, I mean, one of my favorite authors is John Authors, and he has uh, beautifully laid out, of course, exactly what you're saying. What does it mean for the economy? And there's an assumption, base case, but frankly, completely priced in the markets, that we have a soft landing. What well, we'll have, uh, I think what we will not have is a kind of what I would call an immaculate landing. We know we're not going to, we're unlikely to get uh, a perfect sort of 2% inflation, uh, no weakness whatsoever, rates going back to levels that we've seen before. The supply constraints that you and I have talked a lot about in, in the last couple of years are still going to be there. So I think the challenge is how do we get out of a kind of longer higher for longer environment with relatively sticky inflation, which will lead to, to a situation where unlike in the past where central banks had a kind of permanent bias to ease, they may have a longer term permanent bias to tighten. And, and one of the answers, of course, to this dilemma would be um, a boost in productivity. And, and I think that to me is, is the big kind of longer term question. Do we get a boost uh, in productivity coming from AI or something else? that kind of gets us out of this constrained environment of uh, relatively low growth, relatively high rates, and relatively sticky inflation. Yeah, and productivity in the U.S. is, is actually on a tear. We're listening to uh, Thomas Jordan of the S&B saying that they will, of course, adjust monetary policy again if necessary. How much do you look at gold, Philip? I mean, gold at a record high, I don't know if it's symptomatic of actually, you know, traders or other central banks not trusting the Fed and whether that's a debt problem. Uh, look, there, gold is always a kind of a gauge of risk and uncertainty in the world, and we live in a very uncertain, very risky world, not just with regard to where inflation will settle, but with regard to a new trade order, um, fractured geopolitics, we have wars going on, we have very high debt levels, undoubtedly, the U.S. Uh, fiscal situation has deteriorated, of course, uh, you know, quite dramatically uh, in the last couple of years. It has helped in terms of the resilience of growth. You can see that Europe has much uh, weaker growth because it didn't get as much fiscal stimulus. The price to pay is the debt. So, so I do think there are just lots of sources of risk and uncertainty that are embedded in the global economy. And that's what I read into the gold price rather than any kind of monetary uh, or policy implication per se. It's a pretty big, big week actually because we have the SNB, the first major central bank to cut. And then we have the Bank of Japan. Now, it's largely gone unnoticed by the markets because it was telegraphed. But after 17 years, I mean, are there lessons that we take from BOJ and, and the way they try to reflate the economy? I think it's kind of a textbook case, frankly, of how you get out of an extreme, an extremely long regime into a new one. Now, in practice, of course, it was kind of, as you said, it was gradual. Yeah. But nonetheless, I think it was done in a, it was really a master class in how you you know, move from a, from a very entrenched policy stance to a new one uh, while keeping all the options open and not rattling the market. So to me, this uh, really was a master class by Governor Weida. Uh, when you look at some of the, the, I guess, the outside forces, it, it can be politics, it can be, you know, geopolitics, the resurgence or uncertainty surrounding China and its AI. How does that influence how the markets participate and, and what kind of economies we're left with? Uh, the, the easiest way to think about it is if you look at a lot of what is priced in today, particularly in, in risky assets, there is a sense that we are going to somehow come out of this low growth, sticky inflation, high rate or higher rate environment. You know, I think that assumption is implicit in, in the kind of very optimistic pricing that we see in markets, which, by the way, I think looks like it's set to continue given... Uh, the Fed's communication yesterday. And, and implicit in that is something is going to help us get out of this uh, supply constraint world that leads to higher rates, lower growth, and stickier inflation. And, and, and the obvious candidate for it is, of course, a productivity boost that comes from, from AI. It could come from somewhere else. We, you know, productivity boosts, by definition, kind of come from innovation, which we can't predict. But that seems to be the most likely story. So the, I, I think the most interesting thing to do in the, in the years and months and years to come is to sort of observe what can we see in the data that gives us more or less confidence that this unfolding uh, of a productivity boost is actually going to happen. We, to put it differently, we, the world needs it desperately, frankly.
Yeah. Because the new geopolitical regime of constrained production capacity is an uncomfortable one. And the one way to get out of it is you get uh, a boost in productivity that, that then raises uh, and increases production capacity of the world economy. But is there a danger that actually the U.S. You know, takes advantage of this more than anyone else? And we've seen the numbers, we've seen onshoring, we'll, you know, we're questioning the end of multilateralism. And so you have the, the, you know, a very strong U.S. economy. And the, and the rest of the world is kind of scrapping for pieces. There is a uh, there is a clear danger of that. If you look at the the internet boom, right, that raised productivity probably by 15 percent, something like that, and of course created these enormous companies that we now all know in the U.S. and <clears throat> and then we had the energy shock, which was a big disadvantage for Europe relative to the U.S. You know, there's a risk on industrial competitiveness for Europe. I think that is very, in my view, very significant. So yes, I think this has to be a wake-up call for the rest of the world, particularly for Europe, to make sure that the next big boom, in a sense, that will create the next set of big companies, the next source of job growth, doesn't again happen almost entirely in the U.S. The tech story was largely missed by Europe, and the result is today you have almost, you know, maybe one, if at all, kind of major tech company in Europe. Uh, what you want to make sure is that, from a European perspective, that this doesn't happen again. Uh, if AI is to be the next uh, big source of productivity. You know, we'll see. This is hard to predict, but I do think what we can say today is that the world needs, quite desperately in my view, a new source uh, of productivity, a new boost to productivity so that we can overcome some of the constraints on production uh, capacity that we see in the world economy as a result of the new fragmented world. Um, so we also know, of course, that, that BlackRock with the JP deal is trying to grow in private markets. So if this is the future, it, it changes also the way you know banks operate. I mean, it kind of changes the whole construct, right, of the, fi of fina of the financial world. Yeah, I think we're you know we've seen for some time. We call this one of the one of the several mega trends or mega forces. Of course, the kind of disintermediation, in essence, from the banking system towards capital markets, uh, which has many uh, advantages, but poses challenges, of course, for, for banks. Um, and I think, you know, the, one of the advantages here is that private markets are growing. Um, one of the areas that the world is going to need desperately in the years to come is infrastructure. At a time when fiscal uh, capabilities of, of the major countries are really strained, quite severely strained as a result of all the, the crisis fighting that we've had. And so the notion that you have to find ways to mobilize private capital, use public capital to incentivize it, and then mobilize private capital at scale in order to fund all the infrastructure investment needs that are clearly out there, whether it's in this country or, frankly, almost any other country, that we see as a, as a great opportunity for our clients, which is why we've made a big effort to, uh, to become a, a more important, significant player in the space of infrastructure investing. Four and a half billion are going to the polls. The U.S. election probably the biggest one, where you could see the biggest shift. But there's the you know European uh, Parliament elections. There's the U.K. What does this mean for markets? Well, it's it's a great source of uncertainty. Um, I think for the world at large, it means how do you think about the United States? Um, uh, does the United States continue to be the guardian of sort of humanity's interests? Uh, can you rely on the old security arrangements, even on the old monetary arrangements, the Bretton Woods system? You think about the international organizations. They all came out of a world no. where the U.S. in sort of enlightened self-interest created a system that served the world well. Uh, and I think the, the, the big question that will be answered, not just in November this year, but frankly over the, over the years to come, is to what extent uh, do we continue to live in that kind of world or are we really moving on a sustained basis to a much more fragmented world where different regions, different countries have to become in essence uh, more self-reliant and that would uh, imply of course vast adjustment costs. Uh, just think of security alone if that were to be the case for Europe this would imply major major investments in security uh, a very different world. So, you know, to me, the big question here is, uh, I think it was Henry Kissinger who said the, the holiday from history is over at some point shortly before he passed. Um, do we have to prepare for a completely different world where the role of the United States is a different one than yeah. you and I and the previous generation uh, have really become used to since World War II?